G'day, this is Chris Savage from RL Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the book of Zechariah. I pray that it will be a benefit to you and help you to study and to grow strong. Thank you for coming along. Tonight, we're looking at the book of Zechariah. Uh, thank you all for coming in and uh, pray that it'll be a benefit to you. Book of Zechariah, we're looking at chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 5 tonight. In the introduction we have, uh, the introduction is, it, it is the eternal word of God. And we see this in chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of Jehovah unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying, Jehovah was sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say thou unto them, thus saith Jehovah of hosts, Return unto me, says Jehovah of hosts, and I will return unto you, says Jehovah of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets cried, saying, Thus says Jehovah of hosts, Return ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, says Jehovah. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servant, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? And they turned and said, like as Jehovah of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. The theme of Zechariah is the eternal word of God. And it begins in verse one by giving us the call of the prophet. When, when did this take place? Zechariah's call was given in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, which makes it 520 BC. So he began to be a prophet at the same time as Haggai. But uh, Haggai's prophetic ministry covered a period of only three months. Uh, not so as Zechariah. Zechariah's prophetic ministry covers from the period of about 520 to about 470 BC, around about 50 years. It says, on that day, the word of Jehovah came unto Zechariah. What does Zechariah mean? Zechariah means Jehovah remembers. As to his family, we're told that he was the son of Berechiah, which means Jehovah blesses. Then he goes back one generation further and tells us that, Be uh, that Berechiah was the son of Edo. So that's Zechariah's grandfather, which means his time. So you put all these three names together. What we have here is Jehovah remembers and Jehovah blesses in his time. The background, Zechariah's prophecy has to do with the captivity and the return from Babylon. This is after the, the 70 years of captivity in Babylon. Purpose of the book, uh, it, it's to trace the program of God during the times of the Gentiles. Uh, remember, the theme of the book of Daniel was the times of the Gentiles. Now, the theme of the book of Zechariah is, is going to be how Israel lives in the times of the Gentiles. And the overall basic outline is that he has eight visions, chapter one to six, four messages, chapter seven to eight, which we'll, we'll see this a little bit later, and two burdens. The key phrase in Zechariah's book is Jehovah of hosts. And we see it 52 times in his book. Now, where is it taking place? It's taking place in Jerusalem. Uh, the historical setting here, it, it has to do with the captivity and return. Ezra, uh, Ezra in Ezra 5, 1 and 6, 14. Uh, Ezra mentioned that both Haggai and Zechariah were prophesying in and what were they doing? They were, they were encouraging, encouraging the people to rebuild the temple. Uh, remember, about 15 years before this, uh, Nehemiah was down there you know, and, and sort of got the ball rolling, but then there was a bit of a hiatus. And so Zechariah and Haggai are encouraging the people to, to get on with the job, and even though we're facing difficulties, to get on and do it. And by this time, for the most part, Israel had forsaken their idolatry. They had had enough of idols in Babylon. It was a time here when you had the rise of the synagogue. 
the synagogue started out in, in, uh, in, in Babylon. It was a period when in the land, at least, there had been no prophecy in Israel for 70 years. Uh, and, but, but in the exile, in, in Babylon, we had uh, two, we had, well, we had one prophet there who was uh, Ezekiel, and we had Daniel, who was a statesman, but he did prophesy as well, uh, even though that the, the Jewish Bible doesn't regard him as a prophet. And then the spiritual conditions were quite poor in the land of Israel itself, because they had been, you know, decimated. The temple was burnt down, you know, back in 586, and there was no form of worship there. Now, we had uh, uh, the pre-exilic prophets, the pre-exilic prophets, that's pre-exile, uh, and included most of the minor prophets. Um, they all prophesied preceding the exile into Babylon. And, and among those, the major ones were Isaiah and Jeremiah. And then we had the two post uh, or the two exilic prophets, prophets which were Ezekiel and Daniel, um, and both of them were in Babylon. But here we have three post-exile prophets. These are the ones who are prophesying after the, the Jews have come back from exile. Haggai, who prophesied from the sixth to the eighth, or sixth to the ninth month, and then Zechariah, who was a priest. Uh, he was a priest according to uh, um, uh, Nehemiah 12, verse 14, and Nehemiah 12, verse 16. He was the, the son of a priest, Edo. His grandfather was a priest, so Zechariah was both priest and prophet. And he began, Zechariah began to prophesy in the eighth month which means that he began about two to prophesy about two months after Haggai started prophesying. And then much later on came the last of the of the post-exile prophets, who was Malachi. That was quite a while later. Now we, we know uh, but we'll notice that the book of uh, Zechariah it's organized along certain certain thematic revelations, certain themes. Uh, in section one of the book, where we go from uh, uh, chapter one, verse seven to chapter six, verse 18, we have eight visions. And then in chapter seven and eight, uh, Zechariah deals with the question of fasting uh, and the rest of section two centers around four messages. So what do we have? We have eight visions followed by four messages. And then the rest of the book, uh, is two burdens. That's, that's uh, chapters 9 uh, to 11 as the first burden, and then uh, chapters 12 to 14 is the second burden. Uh, and uh, that's the way the book is broken down. Zechariah is quoted in the, in the New Testament. Uh, we see Zechariah 9, 9 is quoted in Matthew 21, verses 4 to 5. Zechariah 11.13 is quoted in Matthew 27, verse 9. Zechariah 12.10, quoted in John 19.37. And Zechariah 13.7 is quoted in, in Matthew 26.31 and Mark 14.27. In verse 2, uh, Zechariah gives a declaration about past history. And Zechariah says that Jehovah was sore displeased with your fathers. And in verses three to four, he issues a call to repentance. Therefore say you unto them, thus saith Jehovah of hosts. So first of all, in verse three, we have this a reciprocal arrangement where God says, return to me, says Jehovah of hosts, and I will return unto you, says Jehovah of hosts. So, Turn back to me and I will turn to you. So what he's saying is that if Israel will return to God, then God will return to Israel. And that's the way it's going to be for Israel during the times of the Gentiles. And this is the, this is the, the issue during that long period of this times of the Gentiles. Um, for those who might remember, the times of the Gentiles is that period of time from the Babylonian destruction of the temple and Jerusalem, which goes right down until 
Messiah returns, his second coming. So it's a time where Jerusalem is primarily dominated by Gentile powers. But now he warns them in verse 4. He says, don't be like your fathers who rejected the prophets. He says, be ye not as your fathers unto whom the former prophets cried. Who are the former prophets? Well, the former prophets are the pre-eggs, the prophets who prophesied prior to them being taken away into captivity. Um, the ones from before the exile. So these prophets, they came and what they did was they were constantly calling to the people to turn back to God. Turn away from your idols, turn back to God. That was the constant call of the prophets. Weren't very popular, the prophets. Uh, examples of this we see are uh, Isaiah 55, verses 6 to 7, you know, where it says, you know, return unto me and I'll return unto you. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 12 to 13. Uh, also Ezekiel, uh, when he's in Babylon, Ezekiel 18, verses 30 to 31. And Hosea in chapter 14, verses 1 to 2. Uh, and in these instances, it was always return the, the prophets were always saying return unto jehovah return unto jehovah and he will turn to you so these came declaring that jehovah is, of hosts was saying to them uh return ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings however this verse here points out that the prophets were all rejected it says but they did not hear nor hearken unto me, says Jehovah. So all the while these prophets, the prophets were, remember the prophets were the messengers from God to the people. And the, mes the message that God was sending to the people was, turn back to me, return to me, turn back to me, turn back to me and I'll bless you, turn back to me and I'll bless you. But not so, said the people. Uh, they thought they knew best. Now, this introductory section here ends in verses five to six, where we have a conflict uh, between God and Israel. And the conflict is in the form of a bit of a dialogue. Uh, God speaks in uh, th God speaks through, through Zechariah in verse five, the first part, 5a, and he asks a question. He says, your fathers, where are they? In other words, their fathers, were dead in fulfillment of the words of the prophets. And then in verse, the second part of verse five, the people respond by saying that the prophets did not make it either. Okay, so our fathers died. But hey, you know what? The prophets, did they live forever? No, they didn't. So, so yes, their fathers died, but so did the prophets. And so everybody ended up the same way. So what difference does it make? That's virtually what the, the conversation's about. What difference does it make? But God responds to that in verse 6. He says in verse 6 that his words which the prophets spoke were fulfilled. He says, my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants to prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So what God is saying is that all the threatened judgments did overtake their fathers. So the answer is yes. And also, in the captivity, in the Babylonian captivity, their fathers had to acknowledge that the word of God had been fulfilled in their lives. In their captivity, when they turned and said, like as Jehovah of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. So they learned the truth of Isaiah 40, verses 6 to 8, that while the grass and the flower may fade, the word of God is going to stand forever. That's what they learned while they were in captivity, that the word of God is sure, it is certain to come to pass. Now we're going into the eight visions, uh, and this section goes from chapter 1, verse 7, to chapter 6, verse 18. In chapter 1, verse 7 to 17, we have the first vision. 
and a bit of a summary of this first vision. Uh, the point of this first vision here is that God has a plan for Israel. In fact, uh, we can summarize the first vision before we, we get into it. First of all, the angel of Jehovah is in the midst of a degraded and deprived people. Secondly, he makes a loving and yearning intercession for them. And third, that results in a promise of future blessing. So the angel of Jehovah is in the midst of his people, even though they're degraded and deprived. In verses 7 to 11, it says, upon, this is chapter 1, verse 7, upon the 4 and 20th day of the 11th month, which is the month Shabbat in the second year of Darius, came the word of Jehovah unto Zechariah, the son of Bechariah, the son of Ido, Berechiah, the son of Ido. The prophet saying, I saw in the night and behold a man riding upon a red horse and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom and behind him there were horses, red, sorrel and white. Then said I, oh my Lord, what are these? The angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these are. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are they whom Jehovah has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of Jehovah that stood among the myrtle trees and said, we have walked to and fro through the earth and behold, all the earth fit, sitteth still and is at rest. So in this first vision, we have the vision of the horses in verses 7 to 11. Verse 7 gives us the date of it. He tells us that it happened on the 24th day of the 11th month, Shivat, uh, which is the Hebrew, Hebrew uh, uh, name for the 11th month. And it was in the second year of Darius, which was the year 520 BC. And again, uh, it makes it the same year that Haggai, the, the previous prophet, was also called. It also means that three months have now passed between the call of the prophet Zechariah in verses 1 to 6, when he begins to see the vision of verse 20. A three-month period has transpired. Three months has now gone. And also, it was at the time that the word of Jehovah came on to Zechariah. Um, uh, the prophet, uh, again, is identified by his father, the son of Berechiah, and by his grandfather, the son of Edo. Now, in verse 8, we read about the horses. So he now introduces us to the fact that he, that he saw a vision. And he said, I saw a vision. I, I saw it in the night. This is a, a common way in which a vision would come to a prophet. And in this vision, he, he says, Behold, a man sitting upon a red horse, and he was standing among the myrtle trees that were at the bottom. Now, the Hebrew word for bottom, it's mesula. It means a shady place or, or a glen. Um, so it was located in the bottom of a low, shady place. And this low, shady place is a symbol of the Gentile world. So that's where uh, this man on the red horse, that's where he's standing down there. Now, behind this key rider on the red horse were other horses, which were of three different colors. We had a red, a sorrel, and a white. I think you might have speckled there in, in some translations. So these other horses uh, represent divine agencies in the affairs of government. Uh, these are actually God's angels, which he uses in dealing with the affairs of human government. And uh, in verse 9, we have the request for identification here from Zechariah. And Zechariah speaks and he says, And then said I, O oh my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, First, I will show you what these are. Uh, now, secondly, I might point out that, that, that uh, this is the rider on the red horse and the angel speaking to Zechariah, right? 
And thirdly, as we're going to see, the angel of Jehovah are all, this is the same person, right? So what we see here is the one individual here goes by three different identities in this vision. Firstly, in verse 8, he's the man riding upon the red horse. Secondly, in verse 10, he's the one revealing these things to Zechariah. And thirdly, verse 11, he's the same as the angel of Jehovah. Now, who is the angel of Jehovah? The angel of Jehovah throughout the Old Testament is the second person of the Godhead. He is God the Son. This, the, the angel of Jehovah is one of the pre-incarnate manifestations of the Son. That's the angel of Jehovah. It's the angel of Jehovah. Now in verse 10, he now gives Zechariah the identification. The man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, and what he said now was, these are they whom Jehovah has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. So the way that he, uh, the way that he identifies these other three beings shows them to be, they're not horses. Uh, they're more than literal mere horses, all right? Rather, th these three are angelic beings, and they have a specific mission in this world. And this mission is especially among the Gentile nations. Notice it says they walk to and fro. And this is one of the Old Testament ways of describing angelic movement. Uh, why do we say this? Because we see this phrase used of Satan, for example, in, in Job one, in Job chapter one, verse seven, and Job chapter two, verse two, where it says, um, talking about the, the Satan and the angels, you know, where have you, where have you been up to Satan? He says, uh, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So this is referring to angelic beings, but that they walk to and fro through the earth. Now, in verse 11, uh, these other angelic beings, they now, report, they now report back to the angel of Jehovah, and they answer the angel of Jehovah that stood among the myrtle trees, we have walked to and fro through the earth. In other words, what, what they're saying is, look, uh, the mission for which we were sent out, it's been accomplished, and now we've come together again into this bottom of this low shady place to let them know that the mission has now been accomplished and the report to the angel of jehovah is all the earth is still and at rest doesn't that sound fantastic the earth is still and it's at rest uh, to you and i that would be wonderful however the earth being still and at rest. And what that means is that nothing is moving while Israel seems to still lie desolate. So nothing is happening. And while it might be, while it might be good for the nations and everything uh, to be still and at ease, that's not good for Israel. For the nations, it might be. But you know what? Uh, this is all about Israel. Yeah, Israel is the focus here. It, what, it, what it means here is that it means that nothing is moving towards the accomplishment of God's plan for Israel. So while that might seem from an initial reading to be a very positive report, it's actually a negative report. Uh, things are not moving towards the accomplishment of the plan. So that leads now to the promise of mercy to Zion in verses 12 to 17 of chapter 1. And that's what we see now. Then, this is, uh, this is verse 12. Then the angel of Jehovah answered and said, O Jehovah of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years. And Jehovah answered the angel that talked with me with good words, even comfortable words. So the angel that talked with me said unto me, 
cry thou saying, thus says Jehovah of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I am very sore displeased with the nations that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. Therefore, thus says Jehovah, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, says Jehovah of hosts, and the line shall be stretched forth over Jerusalem. Cry yet again, saying, thus says Jehovah of hosts, my cities shall yet overflow with prosperity, and Jehovah shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. So, in this second part of the vision, what do we have? What we have here is we have a promise of mercy to Zion. And it begins in verse 12 with the prayer of the angel of Jehovah. This is a prayer of the son to the father, the son, uh, the second person of the Godhead to the father. In light of the negative report uh, from the other angels, uh, nothing seems to be moving towards the, the accomplishment of the plan for Israel then the angel of Jehovah uh, speaks up and he says, you know, he, he now speaks to Jehovah of hosts and he says, how long, you know, how long, how long will there not have mercy in Jerusalem and, and on the cities of Judah? You know, you've had indignation against them for these past 70 years, but how long will you not have mercy on them? In other words, what he's saying is, when will when will when will you, O oh God, begin to restore Jerusalem? When will you begin to restore Jerusalem to the glory that you had promised? Now that the city has, has lain waste for seventy years, this is the seventy years of the Babylonian captivity. The world's at peace, but Israel is in degradation. It, it's a wreck. So it might be good for the Gentiles, but. You know, nothing is happening with Israel. Nothing is happening in Jerusalem. It's bad news for the Jews. And it also means that it, that it appears that God's covenant is not being fulfilled. But what, what we, one of the things we do see here is that, that uh, this, this little section here, it actually shows that uh, there's a specific ministry of the angel of Jehovah which is to pray for the Jews, because that's what he's doing here. He prays for and on behalf of Israel and Jerusalem. Um, if, you, if you look into Isaiah 62, verses 6 to 7, uh, there's a similar ministry that the angels have, have there, the, the angels who are standing on the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, in, in Isaiah 62, uh, 66, 2 to 7, it points out there that God has angels standing upon Jerusalem's walls and their entire, their entire ministry is to be Jehovah's remembrances. What does that mean? It means that they keep on reminding Jehovah to keep on pestering him until he fulfills his promise of making Jerusalem the praise of the earth. In, in Isaiah 66, uh, verse, uh, 62, verse 6, sorry. He says, I have set watchmen upon the walls of Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day and night. They, they are Jehovah's remembrancers taking no rest. So they don't have rest day or night. They, they have no rest. In fact, it, it says they, they will have no rest. They'll give Jehovah no rest until he establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. So on those walls in Jerusalem today, there are angels who are constantly reminding Jehovah God of his promises to make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Now, at that point, in response to the, to the prayer of the angel in verse 13, we have the message of comfort to the angel of Jehovah. Jehovah answered the angel that talked with me, and the contents were, first of all, good words. It's good news. Secondly, these good words were comfortable words. Why? Because they brought, this good news brought comfort. 
And the exact content of the message we see in verses 14 to 17, where Zechariah is told to cry out the following seven declarations, which the angel received from Jehovah. And these seven declarations, we see them here. First of all, in verse 14, he says, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. In verse 15, I am very sore displeased with the Gentiles that are at ease. Again, what, what we see here is that the, the angelic message about the Gentiles being at ease was not a positive one. It was a negative message. And, and God is very sore displeased with the Gentiles that are at ease. So he's, he's displeased with the Gentile nations. And then in fact, the Hebrew is much stronger. It says, with great anger, I am angered. Now, the specific sin of these nations is anti-Semitism because he says, I was but a little displeased. So God was but a little displeased against, not the nations, but against Israel, right? He was a little displeased against Israel. And because of his, of his little displeasure against Israel, he allowed the Gentile nations to attack Israel. You know, remember, the, 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 the prophets were constantly calling Israel to turn back to God. And so God was a little displeased with Israel. And so the, the, uh, uh, the judgment came with attacks from other nations. But then he adds, he said, I was a little, dis little displeased. And now he adds, but they, the Gentile nations, have helped forward the affliction. So this means that while God did not want the Gentile nations to, sorry, while God did want the Gentile nations to punish Israel on his behalf, they went beyond what God had wanted and what God had intended. And so they went further than God wanted. And because they went too far, those nations are now going to be punished. And the same point we see in Isaiah chapter 10. While God did want Sennacherib and the Assyrians to punish Israel, they went well beyond what God had wanted them to do. And this very point that he just made about his displeasure against the Gentile nations is now we're going to, that's going to be elaborated upon by Zechariah's second vision. The third declaration Zechariah makes is in verse 16. He says, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercy. So what this means is that God intends to fulfill his program. Also in verse 16, my house shall be built in it. So what that means is that the Jewish temple will be rebuilt. And while this may have a, a reference to the second temple, which is what you know, the, 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 the Zechariah's down there encouraging the men to do down there. It, it, uh, its ultimate viewpoint is really the millennial temple. That's the ultimate temple, the millennial temple. And we'll see more of this in the fifth vision. And the fifth declaration in verse 16, it says, a line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. What's this line symbolize? Well, this is a symbol for building. The city will be expanded massively, and this will be developed in the third vision. The sixth thing that Jeremiah says, uh, he says, my cities shall yet overflow with prosperity. So besides Jerusalem, uh, the cities of Judah are also to overflow with prosperity. And then in verse 17, we see Jehovah shall yet comfort Zion and shall yet choose Jerusalem. So God, God intends to make Jerusalem his chosen city. And this we're going to see in the fourth vision. Okay, so now we come to the second vision. And we see this in chapter 1, verses 18 to 21. Main point of the second vision is that God is in control. The second vision here, uh, a bit of a summary. Uh, 
it elaborates a point of the first vision back in verse 15, where he says, I am very sore displeased with the nations or, or Gentiles that are that are at ease, for I was just a little bit displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. So God's punishment of the Gentiles uh, for what they did uh, to the Jew is what we have. Uh, we, we're going to see being elaborated in this second vision. And secondly, he points out that God takes into account everyone who lifts up his hand against the Jews. And thirdly, uh, the vision teaches that God has complete knowledge of the condition of his people. He knows everything about Israel, but everyone. Now, the fourth thing uh, in regard to this summary is that he has already pronounced a punishment for those rising against the Jews. And uh, fifthly, uh, we have here the principle of the outworking of the Abrahamic covenant, which we find in, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where uh, uh, you know God says, I will curse them that curse you. So those nations who rose up and uh, were, were, were sore displeased, uh, you know, did more than God had wanted against the Jews, they will be punished. I'll curse them that curse you. Now we have four horns, and we see these four horns in verses 18 to 19 of chapter 1. And Zechariah is talking here. He says, and I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, what are these? And he answered me, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So in verses 18 to 19, the vision now begins with four horns. I lifted my eyes and, my eyes and saw it introduces the fact that what we're seeing here now, this is a new vision. He said, I lifted up my eyes and oh, I saw a new vision, four horns. Verse 19, we have the identification of these four horns, uh, and it begins here with a question raised by Zechariah. He says, he says, when he sees these horns, he says, well, well, what are these? And the answer is given, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. In other words, uh, these horns are representatives of the four Gentile empires who have scattered Israel. Uh, and this had already been revealed in Daniel's prophecy in chapters 2 and 7 of Daniel. Now, who are they? Well, they were first the Babylonian Empire, followed by the Medo-Persian Empire, followed by the Hellenistic Empire. And then we had the fourth Gentile Empire, which is the Empire of Imperialism, that began, it started off with the Roman Empire, and it will actually uh, end with the Antichrist. So that's the fourth empire, which is where we, we're in today. We're in the fourth empire, the empire of imperialism, or, or a type of it. Now, the picture of, a, of the horn of an animal is used throughout the Bible. What's it, what's it symbolizing? Well, it's a symbol of power and pride. Uh, usually it's the pride of Gentile power. And it was these four Gentile powers that had scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Uh, now, all right, Judah, what's, where's Judah? Judah is the southern kingdom. Uh, remember, uh, at the death, uh, under King David, King Solomon, uh, Israel and Judah were united uh, when King Solomon died and his son took over, um, he was not like his father, and the kingdom split. Israel split. Northern kingdom be became Israel. Southern kingdom became Judah. And we see, so we see here, uh, Judah is the southern kingdom, Israel the northern kingdom, and then Jerusalem is given a very separate status. Uh, Jerusalem is special, special. Now we see four smiths or craftsmen in verses 20 to 21. And Jehovah showed me four smiths. Then said I, what come these to do? And he spake, saying, these are the horns which scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. 
but these are come to terrify them to cast down the horns of the nations, which lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. Lots of horns here. Now, after Zechariah has seen the four horns, he now sees a vision of, of four smiths in verse 20. In verse 21, he now receives the identification of these. Uh, and he, again, he raises the question here. And he, uh, what he sees in the vision, he says, well, what, what are these smiths come to do? And the answer is, well, these are the horns which scattered Judah and that no man did lift up his head again. What he's doing here, he summarizes the four horns. The four horns are the ones who are guilty of scattering Israel uh, to the point that it says that no man responded in mercy, that there was nobody lifted up their head. Nobody lifted up their hand to help Israel. So what have these four smiths come to do? Well, they've come to terrify the four horns. So, the four, these are the four that are sent to punish the four horns. These are the four that are sent to cast down the horns of the nations, right? The four smiths are four individual kings or leaders God uses to cast down the four Gentile empires. The first smith would be Cyrus, the king of Persia. Who did he bring down, he brought down the Babylonian Empire. The second a smith would be Alexander the Great, uh, who brought down the Medo-Persian Empire. And then the third was the Roman general Pompey. Uh, he, he finally took away the land of Israel from under Hellenistic control and put it under Roman control. So who's the fourth smith? Well, the fourth smith will be the one who will put down this current or, well, this future leader of the Gentile Empire, and that will be the Messiah. He will be the fourth smith, and he will destroy the final Gentile ruler of the fourth Gentile Empire, and that is the Antichrist. So what do we have? We have, we have Cyrus. We have Alexander the Great, we have Pompey, and then we have Messiah. They're the four smiths. And the reason why these four smiths have come, he says, is they lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter it. Uh, see, see again here, this is the outworking of Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Because these, these, uh, these horns, because they went beyond what God intended when they scattered Israel, the horns are going to be punished. Uh, and this is, again, outworking of, of, uh, of the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, 3. Now we have the third vision. Third vision is in chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. The main point of the third vision is to show that Jerusalem will become the capital city of the messianic kingdom in the millennial earth. Uh, to summarize the vision, it's going to be, it's an elaboration of what was said back in verses 16 to 17 of chapter one. Therefore, thus says Jehovah, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, says Jehovah of hosts, and the line shall be stretched forth over Jerusalem. Cry yet again, saying, Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, My cities shall yet overflow with prosperity, and Jehovah shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. And what he said in these words, he now elaborates on in the third vision. Verses 1 to 5, chapter 2. And I lifted up mine eyes and saw... And behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, whither goest thou? And he said unto me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me, with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him and said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, 
Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls by reason of the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, Seth, Jehovah, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and I will be the glory in the midst of her. So, verses 1 to 5, we have the vision of the man with a measuring line in verse 1. And we're introduced here to a surveyor. That's what he is, he's a surveyor. He's, uh, and here Zechariah starts it by saying, he said, I lifted up mine eyes. What's, what's he doing? What he's saying is, hey, hang on, I've just got a new vision. And the content of this third vision is, is this man with a measuring line in his hand. And the measuring line, what's it a symbol of? It's a symbol of construction or a symbol of building up. So what's the point here? Uh, the, the, the point here is that uh, Jerusalem is destined to be built up. And we see the symbol of the measuring line uh, being used uh, this way in Jeremiah 31, verse 38 to 40. Uh, we see it in Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 3. And we saw it in when we did the Revelation study in Revelation 21, verse 15. So Jerusalem is destined to be built up. She certainly will. And in verse 2, we see the purpose. What's he going at with this measuring line? To measure Jerusalem. And this is in view of her complete restoration. Zechariah again raises the questions. He says, where are you going? Where do you go? And the answer is to measure Jerusalem, to find out what is the breadth thereof and the length thereof. So from this question now comes the, the message of verses 3 to 5. Uh, and beginning in verses 3 and, and the first part of verse 4, we have the angel's command. Behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him. So what we have here is we have the angel of the Lord approaching Zechariah, another common angel who we haven't seen before comes forward to meet him. And he said, run, uh, showing a bit of urgency here, run and speak to this young man. And the young man in this reference is Zechariah the prophet. So the, the angel of the Lord tells a common angel to run urgently over to Zechariah and quickly tell him the meaning of the vision, which we see in the second part of verse 4. Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls. So there will be two reasons why Jerusalem will be like this. First, by reason of the multitude of men and cattle therein. What's, what does this mean? It means that Jerusalem will simply be too large a city with too many people uh, being put within the confines of a wall city. So it's just, it's just huge. And secondly, being without a wall, what's that a symbol of? Well, normally you have walls for protection and security. So in this city, there are no walls because there's no need for security. And we see this uh, in Ezekiel 38, 11, regarding the walled city. It, in Ezekiel 38, 11, it talks about uh, Israel in a time when it's, uh, it's, it's no wars. Uh, very much like today's kibbutzim in Israel. Um, so that's what we're seeing here. And then we see in verse 5, he says, Jehovah will be the wall and the glory. So Jehovah, Jehovah God, is going to be two things to Jerusalem in the Messianic kingdom. Uh, Jehovah will be onto her a wall of fire round about. And uh, this shows the manner of her protection uh, by a wall of fire that will be quite visible and it will burn anyone who tries to touch it as an act of antagonism towards the Jew. And secondly, uh, God will be the glory in the midst of her. Uh, and this is the Shekinah glory that we're speaking about here. So the Shekinah glory will be present in this city of Jerusalem. Uh, and what does that mean? It means that the Messiah will be present in Jerusalem. Why? Because he is the Shekinah glory. He is the he, Messiah is the visible manifestation of God's presence. So there's come a time in the future when this city will be rebuilt. It will be massive, a city. It will need no wars because it, 
it has security from God and, and also the glory of God will dwell within it. So in this verse, what we see here is there are at least two ways in which the Shekinah glory will be manifested. First of all, it will be as a wall of fire surrounding Jerusalem, but also, secondly, we will see it in the person of the Messiah who will be within the city, ruling from the throne of his father David from Jerusalem in the temple. And uh, that is our lot for today. There are contact details there. 